That light is so bright. So bright. Seriously, I need a plan. In accordance with the board's bylaws, as acting chairperson, I will now call the May quarterly meeting of the Board of Trustees of Illinois State University to order at 9 a.m. I note for the record that notice of today's meeting was posted in accordance with the Illinois Open Meetings Act, and the public has been notified of the date, time, and location of this meeting. As included in the notice of the meeting, the university has provided a YouTube link that allows all interested persons to contemporaneously view the meeting and hear all discussions and votes. Trustee Navarro, will you call the roll? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Bone. Present. <laughs> Trustee Abakumi. Present. Trustee Jenkins. Present. Trustee Jones. Present. Trustee Meringa. Present. Trustee Navarro. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Trustee Navarro. We are excited to welcome Dr. Leah Merminga for, to her first Board of Trustees meeting. Trustee Merminga, would you please approach and take the oath of office? <laughs> please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. Swear. That, that I will uphold the Constitution of the United States. That I will uphold the Constitution of the United States. And of the state of Illinois. And of the state of Illinois. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And I will faithfully discharge the duties. Of the Office of the Board of Trustees. Of the Office of the Board of Trustees. Of Illinois State University. Of Illinois State University. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you. We are thrilled to welcome you and look forward to working together. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you so much for the um, uh, opportunity to say a few words. I am excited and thrilled to be part of this amazing and historic institution um, of Illinois. And um, I am just looking so much forward to gladly learn and hopefully teach together. <laughs> so thank you. You have before you the agenda for today's meeting. May I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda? I so move. Trustee Navarro uh, made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Trustee Jones, second. Is there any discussion? Having no discussion, all of those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The agenda is approved. You have before you the minutes um, the meeting minutes of February 17th, 2023. Could I have a motion and a second to review and approve the minutes of the February 17th, 2023 meeting? So moved. Trustee Jones made the motion. Second. Uh, Trustee Jenkins, second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes are approved. Next on the agenda, is public comments. We have several persons who've indicated an interest in making comments uh, to the board today. In accordance with established and recorded policy, the Board of Trustees will allow up to 30 minutes in total for public comments and questions during a public meeting. An individual speaker is permitted five minutes for his or her presentation. If more than two pe persons wish to speak on a single item, it's recommended they choose one or more persons to speak for them. The Board of Trustees will accept copies of the speaker's presentations, questions, and other relevant written materials. If you have any written materials you want to share with the trustees, you may send them to bot at ilstu.edu. 
When appropriate, the Board of Trustees will provide a response to a speaker's questions within a reasonable amount of time. Our first, first speaker is Nick Mazzarelli. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm a student here at Illinois State University. And the reason I come before you today is to notify the board about a very important issue that must be addressed immediately. The issue I'm referring to has to do with the improper and unfair student election that was conducted last month. My time to speak is very limited, so I can't explain all the details right now, but I'll go over the main series of events starting on April 13th. This is the day online voting began for the 2023 student elections. On April 13th, there were multiple names missing from the ballot for more than 10 minutes. This is very important. For more than 10 straight minutes, names were missing from the ballot during the official time it was active. This is documented and I have proof, which I will be giving to the board uh, today. But to continue, it was immediately after I was contacted by many students saying they were not able to vote at, that I, as a concerned student, on behalf of uh, many other concerned stu students, emailed the Dean of Students, Andy Morgan, who then contacted the Student Election Committee, which is responsible for conducting the election, and I made it very clear that there was an error in the ballot. Mr. Morgan, the Dean of Students, replied, it's fixed. That's it. That's all he wrote. And you know what? Uh, he was right. Uh, the election was fixed. Uh, anyways, so that's what happened. It's very simple. Candidates' names were missing from the ballot. The SEC was aware of this, and they failed to do their job by taking the proper steps to address this issue. I have in my hand the student election code. Uh, this is the document that the SEC swore an oath to abide by, uh, which they failed to do. Uh, they violated multiple sections with it in this code, but probably one of the most important sections they broke was on page 18. It says, in the event that a candidate's name does not appear on the ballot, uh, the election for their respective office will be considered void and therefore term terminated. A new election will be arranged as soon as possible, end quote. Uh, it's irrefutable. Uh, if names are missing from the ballot, which they were, then a new student election must be held. Now, my time is running out, so I want to speed things up. Uh, but Board Member Jones, I believe, is an attorney for uh, her profession. So I urge Board Woman Jones and the other members um, to specifically look at the code, which I have provided, and to read page 18 and see for yourself why there must be a new election as stated in the code. Uh, now, for the record, the only reason I bring this matter to the attention of the board is because I care about free and fair elections. I believe every student uh, should have a fair opportunity to vote in an election. Uh, this did not happen, which is why I'm here. My vote and many other students' votes were not counted. The election process was knowingly conducted unfairly. It was undemocratic. Uh, my five minutes are just about up, so I submit the rest of my statement for the record. And on behalf of the student body, I urge the board members to investigate this issue uh, and to immediately instruct a new and fair special election. Thank you. Thank you, Nick Mazzarelli. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite Stephen Lazaroff to come to the podium and proceed with your comments to the board. Thank you so much, Nick. That was really important, what you just had to say. And as you might have heard from Nick, uh, student elections happened. Uh, most people do not know, and we reflexively say that students don't care about student government, but it's because they do not know how it exists and its function in ISU's shared governance. They do not know there are debates or even that there are elections until the days of the election. The vedette did not cover the elections except on the day they began, on the first day of voting, and then on the announcement of results. I ran for student trustee and got 40.8% of the vote, the most successful loss of my life. 
thank you to all the 500 plus of us, maybe one or two of you in this room, who came together to say ISU is not a democracy, that the Board of Trustees is untransparent and unaccountable, that we deserve a democratic governing body composed of students, faculty, and staff, the people who actually know how ISU works. 41,826 steps, 16 hours, and hundreds of conversations. I am so unbelievably proud of the campaign that we ran. Fights for self-determination and democracy against establishment incumbents almost always take multiple pushes in order to build a base out of people who don't believe democracy at ISU is possible, out of people who know, though, that the word accountability is meaningless without transparency. Do we know why the board fired President Kinsey? We do not know. But people who have nothing to hide do not sign non-disclosure agreements. The hundreds of votes I received are votes for me because they met me and talked to me and believe in building a democratic ISU, not because of backroom deals. Our work continues as it always does, but we won big time. So many of us came out and said a democratic ISU is not too radical for them. On that topic of democracy, people might ask, but where is ISU undemocratic? How does this lack of democracy directly produce the suffering, poverty, and debt of ISU students? It is telling that in my time here, I have not, wit I have not once witnessed a contentious vote. Not having debate is not a sign of peace, but a suppression of voices who would disrupt that peace. It's like in a relationship when someone says, oh, we never ever fight. That's not a good thing. It's a sign of the absence of uh, avoidance or silencing, right? It's systematic exclusion here by rendering the most powerful body at ISU boring and mostly invisible. But student trustee was a position of democratic representation that was won by hard-fought students in the quad protesting for representation, not to be filled by people who are only in it for the CV and cozying up to the unaccountable board of trustees who they should be holding accountable. All the bodies of shared governance at ISU were won from struggle and now sit in a state of functional dormancy as it relates to the everyday life of campus. But it doesn't need to. The only vote with actual debate that I ever witnessed was in the, in the academic senate the highest body of shared governance, when undergraduate students and faculty came together to vote down the $40 million College of Engineering in solidarity with over 400 graduate workers on campus who were borrowing our first contract and who made poverty wages $20,000 below the cost of living for Bloomington Normal. However, the Senate is not in fact a real governing body. It is a theater in which shared governance and democracy is proclaimed, but only if you don't disagree with the president or the board. President Dietz came to the board and invoked a special clause that is rarely talked about. The Senate is merely advisory. The president of the board can dismiss their votes whenever they don't like what the Senate votes. When Professor Martha Horst took over as chair, in her first speech, she championed the return of a special relationship where the Senate performs democracy. Chairperson Horst reassured the board that the Senate was in safe hands. The Senate was chaired by somebody who knew the Senate's role was simply to perform democracy, not actually produce a democratic deliberative body. The board of trustees is the most powerful because they decide the everyday and long-term future of ISU, voting on how much money will be spent and where it will be spent. The Board of Trustees is the least democratic institution on campus because outside of the one token student trustee, there is no other representation for the thousands of people on campus. No students and no staff and no faculty. Just these unaccountable governor appointees with no recall process. These folks have distant connections, alumni from past decades, until recently, one trustee's main qualification was owning car dealerships, a steakhouse, and childcare facilities. The person replacing this trustee is the director of the particle accelerator Fermilab, undeniably cool. But she has no connection to ISU. She did not go here. She doesn't have a child here. She doesn't teach here. A sanitation worker, a graduate student, an adjunct faculty knows far more about running ISU than any of these folks could ever know. We deserve a democratic governing body composed of people who actually know how the work is done and would unsurprisingly run a more just and fair and flourishing university. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve and Lazarus. At this time, I invite Rebecca Mangles to come to the podium and proceed with your comments to the board. I apologize if I pronounced your last name incorrectly. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Stephen and Nick. My name is Rebecca Mangles, and I'm a graduate worker in the communication department and a member of the Graduate Workers Union. I don't know why this is on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so 
someone left this laptop here, so I'm just going to exit out of that. There we go. <laughs> All right. Apologies. At least hopefully now I have your attention. Let me re-begin. My name is Rebecca Mangles. I am a graduate worker in the communication department and a member of the Graduate Workers Union. This spring, over eight weeks and seven meetings, we in the union delivered the message to the administration that we are coming from a position of what we deserve, not comparables or how other universities exploit their graduate workers. This is the heart of our campaign. Professionals, not apprentices, we deserve full-time pay for full-time work. Our graduate workers are living at least $20,000 below the cost of living in Bloomington Normal per MIT, and the reason is that President Tarhuli and the Board of Trustees does not pay us for half of our labor. Our research, our laboratory discoveries, our stage productions, our service constitute a significant portion of the production of Illinois State's University's reputation and motor for enrollment. Unfortunately, the administration does not agree and doesn't care about the vulnerability of international workers on restrictive work hours, trying to support spouses and children, several of whom I know. The administration doesn't agree that we should get paid in accordance with the economic value we create, as well as the wages necessary to live stable lives. I'm not living a stable life right now on what I'm being paid. The administration believes they should be able to charge us a tax of over $2,500 for coming to work and study here, and they call it student fees. The administration believes it should be able to extract unpaid labor in a variety of forms. For example, a quote-unquote voluntary mentorship program in my department that is highly prestigious and calls for a significant time commitment, no pay. This fight is so important to us. There is no question we will continue to bargain over the summer, and we will continue to bargain throughout the year, despite the fact that we are not paid to bargain. Hovey Hall's team is paid to be at the table, calculated at over $87,000 a month is their salary, or over a million dollars annually. Yes, I said it, over a million dollars annually. I know that personally I have contributed a lot of unpaid time to ensure that future graduate workers are paid a living wage, and this is work I'm willing to do, but not ev everyone is able to contribute that time. We're committed, and we know we cannot lose focus on the work. We want recognition of the value of our labor and for stability and dignity to be restored in the lives of over 450 graduate workers. These 450 people matter. They contribute significantly to the population, the production of labor at Illinois State University. And we produce tens of millions of dollars in annual revenue in addition to scientific discoveries. We contribute books, and we contribute to less tangible but still very valuable things like ISU's own revenue reputation. Unsurprisingly, the administration has not budged on granting us our very reasonable demands. We are far away from achieving a satisfactory contract, but the process is young, and we look forward to building and expressing the collective power to win a fair contract and address our day every, everyday survival needs. We want to put ourselves in a position to flourish and do the work we came here to do. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca Mangles. Uh, good morning, and thank you for joining us today for the meeting of the Board of Trustees on May 12, 2023. Earlier this morning, the Campus Com Communication Committee hosted a very informative discussion hour, and I want to thank the committee as well as Dr. Tony Pina and Dr. Rosie Hauck for their presentation this morning regarding the university's new learning management system. Speaking on behalf of the board, I want to thank the many faculty and staff who have worked tirelessly to implement this project. Also, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I want to extend our heartfelt congratulations to our May graduates. We look forward to commencement each year and enjoy the time we have to engage with graduating students and their families. We have a very long agenda today, and in the interest of time, I will turn to Interim President Andave Tarhuli for his remarks. Thank you, Acting Chairperson Bone. I also want to congratulate our May graduates. Illinois State University will award approximately 5,000 undergraduate degrees in May and August, which includes more than 1,100 undergraduate students who will be graduating with honors, meaning a GPA of 3.65 or higher. For all of our graduates, 
This is certainly a momentous occasion, and we are very proud of you. You and your families have much to be proud of as we celebrate your many accomplishments. I want to thank graduation services and the Dean of Students Office, specifically Jill Benson, Terry Hoyer, and Amy Miller for their efforts in coordinating Illinois State University's commencement ceremonies for our graduates and their families. Commencement weekend involves more than 200 university volunteers uh, to ensure that our students and their families have the best experience possible. With that said, we look forward to another memorable commencement weekend. I want to be sure to share a few points of pride before we move forward with resolutions. You may have heard that Jane Lynch was on campus. Not only is she a Redbird, but also an Emmy and Golden Globe Award winning actor, and recently she completed three weeks as a visiting artist in ISU School of Theater and Dance. Her time with Illinois State students culminated with a stage reading of Neil Simon's comedy, Lost in Yonkers, which she directed. I want to thank Jane for graciously giving her time, sharing her expertise, and for providing an incredible and unforgettable experience for our students. I am pleased to share that United States Ambassador Gita Parsi has been appointed the inaugural Donald F. McHenry Visiting Professorship in Diplomacy and International Affairs at Illinois State University. Parsi will begin the two-year appointment as a visiting professor in August of 2023. She will be teaching topics in global studies, which focuses on Africa's role in the modern world. Parsi served as the U.S. Ambassador to three African nations, Ethiopia, Chad, and Djibouti. She also served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of African Affairs, leading a team that developed and advanced U.S. policy in Africa. The Donald F. McHenry Visiting Professorship was established by distinguished alum Donald McHenry, class of 57, who served as ambassador and United States permanent representative to the United Nations. He was a member of President Jimmy Carter's cabinet from September 1979 to January 1981. As you know, our students excel in the classroom and beyond. For example, Catherine Helmink and Sage Lepper Cook, both majors, uh, juniors majoring in chemistry, have been named 2023 Gold Water Scholars. They were among uh, two of only 413 students across the nation that received this very prestigious scholarship. The American Association of Physics Teachers also recognized Illinois State as the institution that has received the most winners for the Barbara Lodes Scholarship for Future Physics Teachers. Illinois State University's Solar District Cup team finished second in their division at the 2022-2023 Solar District Collegiate Design Competition. The Solar District Cup, now in its fourth year, challenges multidisciplinary student teams to develop solar plus storage systems to supply mixed-use districts or groups of buildings served by a common electrical distribution feeder. The Esports U Collegiate Gaming Awards were given out last weekend, and Redbirds Esports is honored to have received the award for Facility of the Year, and Overwatch coach Megan Lomanoff was named Coach of the Year. Our faculty, too, are leading the way in their fields and infusing their knowledge into the classrooms. Professor Down Buckner Thomas of Criminal Justice Sciences and Women's Gender and Sexuality, Sexuality Studies recently presented remarks to the United Nations and helped to organize a panel for the 67th session of the United Nations Commission on the Studies of Women. Dr. Dekisa Pinion has been named the inaugural winner of the Higher Education Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leadership Award 
from the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. University Professor of Music Justin Vickers of the Wonsu Kim School of Music has been commissioned to write essays for Eng an English national opera. Dr. Matt Kaplan of the Department of Physics received the $100,000 Cottrell Scholar Award to support his research on nuclear astrophysics, including dark matter and black holes and nuclear weapons policy. I want to congratulate our student athletes and coaches on an outstanding year. Redbird Athletics has won regular season championships in women's basketball and women's tennis. The Missouri Valley Conference Championship in women's indoor track and field, and we are the Midwest Independent Conference Champions in gymnastics, and men's golf recently won the Missouri Valley Conference Championship and is heading to the NCAA Regionals on May 15 to 17. Softball, baseball, and men's and women's indoor track and field championships are still to be determined, and we're looking forward to strong finishes in those sports. I'd like to congratulate Illinois State's four Missouri Valley Conference Coaches of the Year, Jeff Bovey for indoor track and field, Maya Kovacek, women's tennis, Ray Crowley's men's golf, and Christian Gillespie, women's basketball. Congratulations as well to Paige Robinson, who is the first player in Illinois State women's basketball history to be drafted to the WNBA and Illinois State basketball legend, Kathy Boswell, who was inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame at class of 2023 in Knoxville, Tennessee on April 29th. What a year it has been for women's basketball. And lastly, student athletes continue to excel in the classroom. Redbird Athletics earned a four-year academic progress rate or APR score of 990 in the NCAA's latest Division I APR report. The, 1990, the 990 accumulative 17-team multi-year rate exceeds the national four-year average of 984. 11 Redbird teams achieved perfect APR single-year scores of 1,000 for the 2021-2022 academic year. The university will further its commitment to mental health awareness by expanding our approach to student wellness. As part of the Mental Health Early Action on Campus Act, ISU will be launching a new mental health resources website that will provide information about online screenings, clinical services, and support resources and emergency helplines. The site will feature online self-help resources such as Together All and WellTrack Boost and provide specific connections to resources for screening and other support information. As we look ahead to the 2023-24 academic year, enrollment for the fall semester is looking very positive. Enrollment deposits for first-time in-college students are up 1% from last year's record-breaking class. Transfer admits are up 1.5% and graduate admits are up 7.8%. Uh, Continuing registration for the fall is up 2% for undergraduate students. I'm also thrilled to announce that our fundraising efforts have led to tremendous success so far this fiscal year. We had our annual giving day campaign, Birds Give Back, on February 23rd, and it exceeded all expectations. We shattered previous records for single day giving with gifts from 4,443 redbirds, which is an increase of 42% over the previous high. That helped us raise over one million to benefit the Illinois State University experience. This would not have been possible without the hard work and dedication of our annual giving team, the campus community, and exceptional donor support. I'm incredibly proud of what we have accomplished together. Our development team continues to excel, and their work resulted in private support production of more than $31.4 million, $31 million 
for fiscal year 23. This marks the third best production year in our 166-year history. The commitment of our alumni and friends is a strong testament to their confidence in Illinois State's bright future. This is the fourth year in a row that we have achieved this level of success, and it is truly remarkable. I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to all our loyal and generous donors. Your support is the lifeblood of our university and a significant investment in our students, faculty, staff, and programs. Thank you for being a part of our journey and for inspiring us to reach new levels of success. As I wrap up my comments, I would like to recognize the following individuals who have taken on new roles at Illinois State University. Please stand as I say your name so that we can acknowledge you. Dr. Annie Yazajan, Acting Vice Provost for uh, uh, President for Academic Affairs and Provost. Please stand. <laughs> Dr. Craig Gatto, Associate Vice President for Academic Administration. <laughs> Dr. Jerry Burks, Interim Director of Athletics. Don't know if Jerry is in the room, but let's give her an applause. Anyway. <laughs> and as of July 1, Dr. Todd McLeod will begin his role as Dean of College of Education. I also want to take a moment to formally welcome Dr. Andy Morgan, Dean of Students who joined Illinois State University early in the spring semester. Andy. <laughs> and Dr. Tom Kaiser, Dean of the College of Engineering who joined Illinois State on April 1. Tom. Many thanks to all of you for your leadership and dedication to Illinois State University. Thank you. I would now like to call on today's spokesperson for the Campus Communications Committee, Stuart Palmer, Chair of the Civil Service Council and Honors Advising Specialist, for a report. Thank you, Interim President Tarhule. Good morning to all on the Board of Trustees. This is consequently the last time you will see me for some time uh, because I will be finishing my sixth year and last term as chair on the Civil Service Council, so by our bylaws, I have to step away. So I look forward to one last go around here with representing the Campus Communication Committee. So the Campus Communication Committee would like to thank our presenters this morning, Dr. Anthony Pina and Dr. Rosie Hauck, who gave an overview of Canvas, our new learning management system, which will be fully implemented this fall semester. It was exciting to see how this new technology will benefit both our faculty and our students. The committee also recognizes the ongoing transitions on campus and thanks interim President Tarhule and acting Provost Yadzegian for their leadership and hard work during this time. We also note that there has been a change in the student government leadership and congratulate rising senior Eduardo Monk Jr. We look forward to working with him in his role as student body president. The Campus Communication Committee also acknowledges the thorough discussion regarding former athletics director Brennan at the most recent Academic Senate meeting. The transcript of that discussion, including statements entered into the record by various senators on behalf of their constituents, has been provided to the Board of Trustees. Since that time, more information has become public that suggests knowledge of the issues in athletics by several people within athletics as well as across academic administration um, was well known. The Campus Communication Committee thanks Interim President Tarhule for listening to feedback from the campus constituents on an external audit. The Academic Senate, the Administrative Professionals Council, and the Civil Service Council support the decision to move forward with an external audit. To that end, in honor of the shared governance model, we request that the report to its fullest extent possible be made available to appropriate academic Senate committees when completed. We believe these steps will serve to foster transparency and help to ensure the campus community, donors, and the public 
that the proper steps are being taken. The Campus Communication Committee thanks Interim President Tarhule for actively listening to student concerns regarding the recent athletic director situation by taking action and withdrawing the request for an increase in student fees that were to be directed to athletics. The committee also welcomes Dr. Jerry Beggs as the Interim Director of Athletics and wishes her every success in this new role. We believe this choice by Interim President Tarhule was an appropriate step that will go a long way to assure students, staff, donors, and the public that athletics leadership is moving forward and realigning itself with the mission, vision, and values of Illinois State University. The Campus Communication Committee recognizes the general feeling by faculty, staff, and students of being unsettled due to all the recent abrupt leadership changes. The lack of publicly shared details surrounding these changes is frustrating to the campus community. Senior leadership was noted as a weakness in the results of the coach survey, which is available on the provost's website. Therefore, to ensure campus transparency, the, community, <coughs> the committee once again strongly suggests that the Board of Trustees pursues an open national search for the university's next president to further foster the trust of the university and the community. The committee would also like to acknowledge many of the positive things that are happening on campus. The academic, recently uh, academic Senate recently passed a curriculum for the new College of Engineering majors, as well as the curriculum for the new Data Science major. The Academic Senate also endorsed the creation of the new School of Creative Technologies within the Wansuk Kim College of Fine Arts. These new majors and the school will continue to attract quality students to our campus and will help to set our students up for success in their future careers. The committee is also very encouraged by the positive recruitment and retention report of underrepresented students that was recently given to the Academic Senate. The committee is very excited by the new Connected Communities Initiative, a new partnership between OSF Healthcare and Illinois State University. This new partnership will allow our students and our faculty to work alongside clinicians and healthcare administrators on innovation in multiple areas, including healthcare engineering, data science, as well as education. The Campus Communication Committee is also pleased with the update to policy 5.1.8, which now includes information on dismount zones around campus that will help to ensure the safety of our pedestrians on campus. This change in policy occurred as a result of tragic pedestrian accidents. The Planning and Finance Committee, of which I served, of the Academic Senate concurrently worked on a policy brief that addressed campus pedestrian and vehicular safety on campus. The committee's report recommended that the university integrate pedestrian and vehicular safety concerns into the university's master plan. The Com Campus Communication Committee concurs with this recommendation. The committee would also like to recognize a very important upcoming holiday. We wish all mothers a very happy Mother's Day. The committee would also like to congratulate, as so many have, all of our graduating students, which is why we're all here, and wish them all the best in all that they will do in the future. Finally, the committee extends our most sincere thank you to all faculty and staff on campus for their hard work and dedication this spring semester. Our faculty and staff are dedicated to the success of our students and this institution. And regardless of our recent issues, we will get through thanks to the tireless efforts of our faculty and our staff. This university, as always, has much to look forward to, and together we will continue to provide the best experience and environment for our students our faculty, and our staff. With that, I will close, as I have closed every letter before this board, and so many have done before, and say, go you Redbirds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. I would like to invite Brian Bernardoni to the podium for a brief legislative update. Brian serves as Chief Strategy Officer for Strategia Consulting and is working closely with Illinois State University until the position formerly had by Jonathan Lackland is filled. Brian will provide the board with a brief legislative update. Brian. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, as, as Dr. Tuhuli mentioned, my name is Brian Bernardoni. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Strategia. We're certified WBE and NC, and we were retained by Illinois State University in January to provide consulting 
and lobbying services for the Office of the President in the University. We've been asked to provide a brief report for uh, your consumption. Uh, Strategia has provided guidance and direction on improving the footprint and impression of Illinois State University with the governments. We are identifying improved ways to articulate the impact of legislation and regulations, not only as part of a collective with other universities, but assuring that ISU has its own voice in Springfield as well. We're proud to have worked with the Office of the President and the Cabinet on several issues of consequence since we were retained. Efforts surrounding interaction with the Governor's Office, state appropriations for the university, regulatory issues related to the uh, ISBE and the Illinois Board of Higher Education, as well as major le legislation impacting Mennonite in our school nursing, and building primary relationships between the university and members of the Illinois General Assembly have all been undertaken. Dr. Tahuli and the cabinet performed admirably during appropriations hearings. Uh, we, we had appropriation hearings with both in the House and the Senate. I can tell you unequivocally, it was very well received. Uh, the question and answer periods were, were very direct and we were able to perform at the very highest level. I think that's reflective uh, not only in the testimony that was given, but also in the budget appropriation, which I'm sure Dr. Tahuli will share in perhaps more detail. Um, I've been asked to brief on two brief issues that are, are actually kind of front burner for us right now. It's taken up a lot of time. I want to thank General Counsel <laughs> and Dr. Newbrander from Mennonite for uh, really taking some leadership. Uh, right now there's a bill going before the Senate it's known as House Bill 2509. It would have a significantly negative impact on Mennonite and the nursing practice across the state. It's one of those rare opportunities where you're actually working with IDFPR on the same side of a bill. So it's a very exciting opportunity for us that we are on the side of right on this one. We're in active negotiations with both the sponsor as well as some of the proponents to come up with either better language or to be candid, blunt, and direct to kick it into, into the summer and maybe come out with a better piece of legislation this fall. <coughs> the second thing that we're working on is actually an interesting project with UHI, of all things. Uh, there, are, there is a, a very procedural thing that I, the Illinois State Board of Education puts forward that essentially would prohibit kids that are at UHI from taking additional AP classes because they have to take gym. Any other grade school, elementary school, any other high school can provide waivers. We cannot. So we are working on, uh, on getting beyond the language of the regulation and getting now to the intent of that. And I'm sure the intention was not to prohibit kids at UHI from taking AP classes and form a gym. I share those two issues for this reason and this reason alone. There's a broad range of issues that ISU covers, from both the legislative appropriation side to very specific things with licensing and nursing to regulatory factors. It's been a pleasure to work with ISU. You should feel very good about your leadership team, general counsel, and your deans, as well as the cabinet who worked tired and really did work tirelessly to get us through the appropriation process. We believe the appropriation process is going to net exactly what the governor said, and we feel very, very good about where ISU stands amongst our peers. Any questions? Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. We have a unique opportunity this morning to learn about a three-minute thesis competition. At this time, I ask uh, Dr. Noel Selko, director of the graduate school, to come to the podium to introduce Sadia Sultana, the winner of the three-minute thesis competition. Thank you, Interim President Tarhule. The three-minute thesis is a research communication competition that challenges master's and PhD students to describe their research topic and its significance in just three minutes to a general audience. This past February in the Normal Theater, 11 students presented their research after being selected as the top candidates from their respective colleges. 
School of Biological Sciences doctoral candidate Sadia Sultana was the university winner with her presentation, Survival of the Fittest, a Bleach Defense System in Bacterial Pathogens. Sadia presented at the Midwest Association of Graduate Schools three-minute thesis event on March 31st with 49 other university winners from within the Midwest. Sadia is here today to address you with her winning presentation. Please join me. <coughs> I think I can use that one because my voice is pretty loud. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Can you recall the chemical that you smell when you first escape into a swimming pool? Bleach is also present in the pig water. And almost all of us use bleach as a household disinfectant. Now, the purpose of using bleach is always to not kill unwanted microbes. But do you know that inside our body, we are also producing bleach to kill pathogens that otherwise have no business to be in our body? We actually, we have very sophisticated immune system to fight with invading bacteria. An important member of our immune system is neutrophils. Neutrophils are present in our blood to search for pathogens and whenever they recognize a pathogen. <laughs> so in this killing process, we procure the toxic antimicrobial bleach. So over my PhD, I was then wondering how does different bacteria respond in the presence of bleach. To study this, we use Escherichia coli or E. coli as a model of this. Because E. coli is a very diverse bacteria, and they can be found in different parts of our body. There are E. coli that is good for us. There are E. coli that cause different type of infection, such as in the style of pathogen E. coli that cause diarrhea, or mutant that cause urinary tract infection or urea. I found that mutants are highly robust and able to survive better in the presence of bleach and mutants. On the other hand, in the style E. coli are not good. We identify the gene that we name as factor X that allows you pets to survive better in presence of bleach and neutrophils. In fact, the gene is so important that when we delete the gene from you pets, now the new pet turns into as sensitive to bleach and neutrophils as in the sinal E. coli as your second pet. So, what does this factor X? Thank you, Sadia. Are there any questions from the board for Sadia? <laughs> I have a question. Okay, so urinary tract infections are particularly difficult in elderly patients and lead to urosepsis and death for many of them. Um, do you see a possibility with the CRISPR technique or something like that that could rectify the factor X? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So how did you get the factor X so we out of that? So we are looking for a candidate gene that can make the bacteria more sensitive to bleach, particularly because neutrophil generates bleach. So then we found the gene by doing an RNA 
sequencing process that is highly up regulate what gene actually changes expression in terms of weight. And we found this candidate, so when we delete this candidate from our bacteria, then we get a very good phenotype that the whole bacteria is very sensitive in those conditions. Okay, thank you. For those who don't know, Dr. Carty Bourne is a physician. <laughs> 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 and medical doctor, so not surprising that she will ask those questions. Any other questions from the board? <coughs> Seeing no further questions, yeah, I'd, like to make that <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make a few introductions before moving ahead with the resolutions. First, I'd like to introduce to you our new student body president, Eduardo Monk, Jr. Eduardo is a junior major in political science and political communications from Highland Park, Illinois. Under his administration, he hopes to increase mental health resources for students and create a more transparent student government association. Eduardo has already been recognized, so thank you. <laughs> in addition, we typically introduce the incoming student trustee at this meeting. However, this individual needs no introduction. Ash Ebikumi was elected for a second term during the student elections this spring. He will take office for the 2023-2024 academic year during the July Board of Trustees meeting. Please join me in congratulating Ash. <laughs> Lastly, Congratulations to Dr. Martha Horst, who was re-elected as chair of the Academic Senate. She has served in the Academic Senate for 12 years and has also served as secretary of the Senate. Dr. Horst is a professor of composition and theory in the School of Music and is a talented composer of classical music. Dr. Horst, would you please stand so we may recognize you. I look forward to working with all of you in the coming year, and we'll now move on with the agenda. We will have one information item to, produce, uh, to present to the board. May I proceed, Chair? Yes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> information item number 2023.05-01. First reading amendment of Board of Trustees governing document regarding pricing guidelines. The Board of Trustees of Illinois State University approved the Board of Trustees governing document policies with resolution number 97.05 slash 12 dated May 9, 1997. The Board of Trustees governing document currently includes specific guidelines for decision making regarding price setting, revenue generation, affordability, and use of funds and when the university is able to use differential tuition. Differential tuition is defined as an amount charged on top of base tuition. The current governing document states that differential tuition should only be charged under three specific conditions. To comply with the truth in tuition statute, to differentiate state residency statutes, and to differentiate undergraduate from graduate instruction. Setting tuition and fees is always a complex exercise, requiring the balancing of affordability for students and their families with maintaining high educational standards while also managing the increasing cost of campus operations. The Board of Trustees proposes to amend Section C, Chapter 4, Number 5 of the governing document to remove restrictions on the university's ability to charge differential tuition and allow the board to approve differential tuition on a program by program basis. Charging differential tuition for certain academic programs has become a standard practice by a number of public universities throughout the state of Illinois and other peer, cross applicant, and regional competitors. Universities that use a differential tuition model base tuition cost on factors such as a student's field of study, the market value of a degree, student demand for the major, 
and the cost of instruction. Differential tuition generates added revenue for select programs with higher instructional costs. The administration estimates that if, if Illinois State University continues with current practices regarding tuition fee charges, several negative consequences could arise. These include, amongst others, increased tuition costs for all students. The university may lose faculty. We may be uncompetitive or be unable to hire faculty in some areas, and the university may experience reduced flexibility for strategically supporting areas of high growth. The university may also experience reduced flexibility for need-based student financial aid in high demand but expensive programs. Permitting the university to charge differential tuition for these types of programs minimizes the impacts to only those students that are enrolled in these specified majors rather than imposing larger increases in tuition for all students. Additionally, students enrolled in these programs receive the added value from these in-demand majors that tend to command a higher salary upon graduation. The additional resources provided through the implementation of a differential tuition rate for certain programs will allow the university the flexibility to retain current and attract new talented faculty while meeting market demands. It also allows for enhanced student learning experiences through improvements to lab equipment, research facilities, and the innovative technologies needed for these programs with greater operating costs. The revised section of the Board of Trustees governing document is proposed as follows. The Board of Trustees of Illinois State University sets broad goals for the institution and adopts policies designed to guide the administration in achieving these goals. Implementation of the Board's policies is delegated to the President, who in turn charges the various administrative offices with developing specific procedures and practices. Setting the university's strategic direction through policies for student pricing is among the most important roles of the Illinois State University Board of Trustees. Adopted guidelines. The graduate tuition rate should reflect more appropriately the higher cost of graduate instruction. Differential tuition for a program may be charged upon approval by the Board of Trustees. Illinois State University's tuition should be comparable and competitive with tuition charges at competitor Illinois public universities. Illinois State University should continue to devote a portion of new tuition and fee revenue to assist university students who are eligible for maximum monetary award program grants from the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, but whose grants <coughs> fall short of the university's tuition and fee charges. Illinois State University should review routinely and assess the amount, use, and allocation process of tuition waivers. The revenue derived from student charges should be allocated only by the university's annual budget process to address the highest current priorities. Until the university is again able to address operational cost increases on a campus-wide basis, Student fee increases should be limited to that necessary to support salary increases for employees in fee-supported areas. Room and board rates should increase to the upper quarter among Illinois residential public universities and an adequate proportion of those revenues allocated to the repair and renovation fund in order to support the current long-range housing and dining plan. Finally, Illinois State University should incorporate the demand for innovative spaces as part of its room and board processes. Thank you. So this item will be considered at the October Board of Trustees meeting. The information was prepared by Board Counsel Carrie Haas. I invite you to address any questions or concerns to her before the October Board meeting. We'll now proceed with the agenda. Thank you. I present now the resolutions. Resolution 2023.05-14, fiscal year 2024 spending authorization. 
the Board of Trustees is obligated to approve the university's annual operating budget. This resolution is brought to the board each year at this time to keep the university operating between July 1 and approval of the annual operating budget at the October Board of Trustees meeting. Because this is the last scheduled meeting of the Board of Trustees before the start of a new fiscal year on July 1, the university requests your approval to spend budgeted funds begin July 1, 2023 prior to a final approval, uh, final approved state appropriation funding level and approval of the fiscal year 24 university operating budget. The university will return with a resolution authorization for the fiscal year 2024 operating budget at the October quarterly meeting after state funding for the fiscal year is finalized. The tables accompanying this resolution present fiscal year 2024 spending authorization by object and function of expenditure and anticipates uh, projections of stable student enrollment. Primary cost increases are anticipated in personnel services and awards and grants. Personnel services increases include anticipated cost increases for minimum wage, salary agreements put in place in fiscal year 2023, and merit compensation increases. Awards and grants reflect an increase to student financial aid reflecting the university's com commitment to college accessibility. Cost increases in all categories for, uh, for current inflationary factors were considered as well. Capital investments for plan deferred maintenance and renovations continue to increase due to the continued need to improve existing facilities, supporting academic instruction and students related spaces. Total projected expenditures reflect approximately a 4% increase over fiscal year 2023. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved. Uh, Trustee Ash made the motion. Trustee Abakumi, I'm sorry. Is there a second? Second. Trustee Jones, second. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you, Chairperson Bowen. Resolution 2023.05-15, approval of student tuition, fees, and room and board rates for academic year 2023-24. to Setting tuition and fees is always a complex exercise, but the impact of employee wage increases and minimum wage law, increases in financial aid, inflationary increases in operation expenditures and deferred maintenance and capital projects highlight the importance of the university's goal of balancing fiscal accessibility for current and future students while maintaining sufficient operating resources. Illinois State recognizes the increasingly important role that revenue from tuition and fees plays in ensuring appropriate funding for educational excellence and is committed to promoting academic innovation and program enhancements while maintaining access to and affordability of its high quality programs. With this in mind, the university is recommending for fiscal year 2024 a modest 2.7% total cost increase over fiscal year 23, making the total cost of attendance for a full-time undergraduate student, including student health insurance, at $27,047 before financial aid is applied. This increase includes a 1.9% increase in tuition and a 1.9% increase in mandatory student fees. Increases in mandatory student fees will benefit the general activity, the born student center, and health and wellness fees. Each year, fee increases are reviewed and those increases, if supported, are recommended by the Student Fee Review Committee. The Association of Residence Halls, or ARH, reviews recommendations for room and board for the next year and makes a recommendation to the Vice President for Student Affairs. 
ARH endorsed a 4% increase for housing and dining costs for FY24. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved, Ebikumi. Uh, the motion's made by uh, Trustee Ebikumi. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Jones. Is there any discussion? <coughs> I have a couple questions. <laughs> Uh, the 4% increase for housing and dining, how many students does that impact, approximately? That's back over here. Uh, thank you for your question. That would uh, um, affect approximately 5,000, between five and 6,000 students who live within our residential environments. Okay, so no other students, but those who live with us. Primarily, first year students and sophomores. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then um, the student fee increases um, benefit general activity. I guess I'd like just a little elaboration on what general activity, the student center, health and wellness fees, what that means. Absolutely. Uh, the general activity fee that we are looking for an increase in would actually support some new programs uh, that we think are needed for student retention and in order to address uh, student well-being. Uh, in specific, we are talking about a co-responder type of program that would uh, match up a case manager uh, with um, police personnel as well as our housing staff to address late night issues that we have within our residential environments in order to support our students before we lose them, right? So that's one of the programs programs we're talking about. Another program would be our Safe Redbirds program. Uh, one of the things that we heard this past year is that students would like a lot more information as it relates to some of, some of the programs we already have as it relates to supporting them when incidents take place uh, on or around campus. And so we're going to be targeting not only the general student body, but targeting some of the underrepresented students on campus as well, as they have really talked about how this is, exacerbates their experience on campus as well. So those are some of the programs that would go into the uh, general activity fee. Uh, as it relates to uh, the Bone Student Center, we're asking for an increase in that area. Uh, some of you may have experienced or seen uh, over the last couple of weeks, we had a little pipe that burst over here on this side of camp, uh, the building and so forth. We've not had an increase in the Bone Student Center uh, fee uh, for a number of years uh, and you know what it takes in order to accumulate some funds in order to do the great renovations that we have here but we've also got to maintain these facilities as well so these would help to maintain the facilities as well as we've had increased uh, salaries for our staff within the facility as well so that's the Bone Student Center and then lastly the health and uh, wellness uh, fee we're asking for an increase in that area because um, our counseling services staff uh, 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 need uh, increase in salaries in order to compete with those counselors off, off campus and throughout the nation in that sense. So it's to address salaries within counseling services as well as add additional counselors within that area. Thank you. And then um, as far as the student health insurance, is it remaining the same for the students? You'll be glad to hear it is. Thank you. Okay. So is the health and wellness is that the only student fee that goes towards salaries of staff? Uh, no, it, it's a combination of the general funds, uh, some funds that we have within um, our particular area, student affairs. Sometimes there's mixed salaries and so forth as well, but that would take care of a portion of their staff um, salaries. I have a question, mm -hmm. and it's probably for Vice President Stevens. Um, you know, I know we removed the um, athletic fee because of the sentiments of, of, you know, what happened with the personnel issue. But I'm curious, there's still 450 students that have a greater need for travel, um, for, for study, so on and so forth, for athletes. That's about a million dollars that we're losing out with that fee increase. What are we going to do to kind of address that deficit? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for that question. Um, it is very true. Uh, when we, we expanded the Missouri Valley 
league and added some additional teams. Those teams occur are, are currently located in states where the ability to travel by uh, lower cost means uh, was not there. And so what um, what we're going to do is spend time, obviously, as the chief financial officer to work with our athletics um, division and examine through uh, out their budgets um, and continue to see whether there are opportunities for cost savings to also look at, at some reserves that they may have and then and then work with the leadership of the university to look for uh, what we may believe just simply will be just temporary advancements there uh, for resources as we try to work through this initiative uh, but um, we I'm very confident that we'll be able to to absorb those costs uh, as we work in kind of a partnership together. Thank you. Trustee Jenkins. Uh, Vice President Stevens, I'll probably keep you up there for a quick question. Is there a back of a napkin kind of calculation that you can do for, say, a $1 tuition increase um, and what that generates for the institution? And what I'm getting at, what I'm kind of the back, you know, backing that out, what I'm looking at is, has our credit hour production for undergraduates increased over the the past couple years? I know enrollments increased. Has the credit hour production increased? Because then that would generate more resources um, under a, a stable tuition increase or stable tuition. And so I, I'm just trying to, for at least my my mental calculation, sure. when we increase general fees or tuition by a dollar, what does that generate by and large? I can answer the question probably more by percentage. Okay. Uh, yeah. The first of all, um, thank you for your question. It does give me an opportunity to share more information than what can be listed in these resolutions. About a um, um, our, our approximate 1.9 you know percent increase, given our current enrollment, we typically in these documents only um, address what our current enrollments, which is somewhere around 20 20,600 students. That today generates uh, a little over 500,000 student credit hours. We are a traditional face-to-face um, -face campus. We do not have a lot of part-time students at all, thankfully, so it's fairly predictable. We are anticipating um, uh, and hoping for to increase those student enrollments in the fall, uh, which I anticipate that that will, given the nature of how we teach, we're pretty much a full-time uh, student population. So. Uh, about a 1.9% tuition increase that only applies to the entering class, is that, which is entering freshmen or entering transfer uh, students, will probably generate somewhere around uh, around one and a half million dollars. Um, again, everything is locked. Um, that is obviously in, uh, earned, and in every year that that cohort goes through. So this 1.9% without any attrition at all would generate you know, over the next four years, about, you know, about $6 million. It was about one and a half million dollars a year. Thank you for taking that slider of a question that I sent to you and hitting a base hit out of it. That was, that was impressive you. work. Thank I'm you. I'm glad I actually had to help answer that one. <laughs> uh, Scott Jenkins, if I, uh, Trustee Jenkins, if I may add, you are absolutely right. Each time we raise the tuition, we generate additional revenue. What doesn't come true in this request is the rate of increase in the expenses. And I'll give you just one idea, one area where we're really experiencing galloping uh, cost, and that's financial aid. So financial aid, the amount that we give to students to enable them to attend the university is our fastest rising expense at this university. Uh, in 2015, which is eight years ago, we spent approximately $25 million on financial aid. Currently, it's about $47 million. So our expenditure on financial aid has gone up about $22 million, certainly over $20 million in eight years with no increase in enrollment or credit our generation. So if you think about increasing tuition by 1.9%, that applies to only the first cohort, as Vice President Stephen says, and brings in about $2 million. But our cost is rising much more than that, you know, three to four million per year, uh, at least as a result of financial aid. And that's only one category. Then when you look at other categories of expenses to do, for example, with increases in minimum wage laws that we must meet, 
our costs are rising far faster than the revenue that we can generate from increased tuition. So even with these tuition increases we're proposing, the university is still being pinched by reduced margins of operations. And this is why we have the need uh, for the increases that we, uh, we must bring to the board. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Bone. Resolution 2023.05-16, approval of BS, uh, Bachelor of Science in Data Science. Illinois State University is seeking authorization from the Board of Trustees to seek approval of a proposal for degree granting authority for the BS in Data Science. The data science major prepares students with a technical knowledge and computational skills to meet current and future problem solving and analysis of large data sets. The data science program is an interdisciplinary major with three core areas of curriculum, including mathematics and statistics, information technology and computer science, and an applied sequence for contextual application in an area linked to the future career path of the students. The sequences include <coughs> big data and computational intelligence, business analytics, population health, social demographics slash public policy analytics, and five, an individualized plan of study. An increase in employer demand and a large number of relevant job postings indicate strong need for program graduates. The interdisciplinary program will be administered by the Department of Mathematics in the College of Arts and Sciences. The program is expected to enroll up to between 50 and 60 students each year. Faculty teaching in the program will deliver the new program at its inception with additional instructional capacity provided by the Office of the Provost as necessitated by enrollment growth. Existing courses can be used to deliver the program. The proposal was approved by the Academic Senate on April 12, 2023. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved, Abakumi. Second, Jenkins. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you, Chairperson Bone. Resolution 2023.05-17, approval of BS in engineering. Resolution 2023.05-18, approval of a BS in electrical engineering. And resolution 2023.05-19, approval of BS in mechanical engineering. Illinois State University is seeking authorization from the Board of Trustees to seek approval of proposals for degree granting authority for three new programs, a BS in Mechanical Engineering, a BS in Electrical Engineering, and a BS in Engineering. The programs were developed in response to a high need in the state and surrounding states, as well as many requests for such a program from prospective students. The proposed degree programs will increase both the number of Illinois residents attaining a degree and the number of high-quality post-secondary credentials available to meet demand, especially since some qualified high school graduates choose to leave Illinois if they are not accepted into the engineering program of their choice. The proposed degrees will not only provide innovative and rigorous engineering programs of study, but also the integration of both electrical and mechanical engineering principles and a strong background in design. Distinguishing characteristics of the Illinois State University engineering programs are as follows. One, the program features a multidisciplinary approach that involves an individual or team integrating and synthesizing knowledge from across a variety of disciplines to bridge the gap between academia and industry. Two, a focus on equitable and inclusive practices that train ethical engineers to design with empathy and keep justice in mind. 
and three, an integration of information literacy throughout the curriculum, resulting in engineers that think and evaluate information critically within and beyond their engineering discipline. The three programs are expect, expected to enroll up to 130 students each year. The three programs will be administered by the new departments of mechanical <coughs> engineering and electrical engineering in the new college of engineering. Th these are the initial degree programs to be offered in these new units. The program proposals have been developed by an ad hoc committee of Illinois State University faculty with experience and expertise related to the field of engineering. The proposals were approved by the Academic Senate on April 26, 2023. I ask for your approval for these resolutions. May I have a motion and a second to approve these resolutions? So moved. I'll second. Uh, Trustee Jones made the motion and Trustee Navarro second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you. Resolution 2023.05-20, authorization for a new unit of instruction, instruction in creative technologies. Illinois State University is seeking authorization from the Board of Trustees to seek approval from the Illinois Board of Higher Education, IBHE, to establish a School of Creative Technologies. The proposed School of Creative Technologies will elevate a program that includes two interdisciplinary degree programs that have been in place for over two decades into a standalone unit, bringing it into alignment with the structure of the existing schools in the college. The development of the School of Creative Technologies will support continued enrollment growth and attract and retain faculty from a range of disciplines whose scholarly and creative activities will continue to position the unit as a leader in these emerging technologies. Pending approval by the Illinois State uh, University Board of Trustees and the Illinois Board of Higher Education, the Vice President of Finance and Planning will allocate central funds for the hiring of a new school director and a budget associate in the School of Creative Technologies. Current faculty teaching in the program will continue to deliver the program at its inception with additional tenure track lines and instructional capacity provided by the Office of the Provost as necessitated by enrollment growth. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So move the Bakumi. Second. So the motion was uh, made by a Trustee Ebakumi and second by Trustee Merminga. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all of those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you, Chairperson Bowen. Resolution, yeah, you may clap. <laughs> Resolution 2023.05-21, authorization to increase the contract with Pearl for the Illinois Tutoring Initiative online tutoring uh, platform. The Illinois Tutoring Initiative has partnered with Pearl to host online tutoring sessions, collect and catalog data from tutoring sessions, house tutor resources, and provide a systemic uh, workflow, systematic workflow and task list, task list for tutors, including training and compliance checks. ISU is uniquely situated to provide the necessary leadership for supporting a statewide tutoring initiative for the students, families, and teachers in Illinois schools, and the relationship with Pearl is integral for data collection and overall delivery of this initiative. Current software and technology data solutions at ISU are unable to be scaled up to meet the needs of the ITI within the project deadline. ITI contracted with Pearl to build, maintain, and support all data collection and reporting for project deliverables. 
Their proprietary tutoring platform provides the tools needed to onboard, match, schedule, manage, <coughs> and report on hundreds of thousands of tutoring relationships at a time. The contract is critical for nimble response to project needs on a short project timeline. Pearl will provide additional services and deliverables to the previously approved resolution, which was 520, on 5-23-2022, or the ITI grant. Approval in 2022 included licensure fees, as well as projects related to forms, multi-user classroom development, creation of regional administrative roles, creation and development of a tutor matching algorithm, expansions to reporting ca capabilities, and increased scheduling capabilities. The university seeks authorization from the Board of Trustees to increase the contract with PAL for the current year and add two renewals for fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25 for the purpose of licensing, training, and design not to exceed $800,000 per year to be paid out of the Illinois Tutoring Initiative. This annual arrangement will allow for the construction and maintenance of an electronic application for students across the state of Illinois to receive tutoring hours and to manage tutoring data and reporting. Sources of funding for this project is provided by Illinois Tutoring Initiative Grant. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved, Ebikubi. Uh, Trustee Ebikumi has made the motion. Is there a second? Second, Jenkins. Uh, second by Trustee Jenkins. Is there any discussion? Could you talk more about the funding? Oh, can you talk more about the, the grant funding? Is this a one-time thing, a renewable? Just talk to us about the grant. Sure, I'm Craig McLaughlin, Associate Vice President for Research and Graduate Studies. Dr. Christina Borders, the Director of the ITI Initiative in the back, has asked me to uh, come on her behalf. Uh, this is state funded. Uh, we saw the need for, with the COVID and students being out of the classroom, uh, they were falling behind. There's a lot in the news about students falling behind. So we received a large state contract to be the center of uh, 59 districts across the state serving 138 schools with 750 tutors so far, thousands of students. And so it's all state grant funding that comes into us and we manage it. Uh, some of it goes directly to the other hubs. Um, so this is basically using additional state funds that will come in, but because we're housing it and it's over a certain dollar amount, it must be approved by the Board of Trustees, but these are all passed through dollars. Um, it's a very successful program. I think Dr. Borders is to be commended while I have the mic, um, but it is a fantastic program. It's all grant funding, so it's simply passed through. Thank you. Dr. Bowman, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I don't get to call on you. Do we have to, do we, do we have to apply for that grant yearly then? Uh, it's a contract, and we already have the renewals. Dr. Borders, well, we get the, we get the contract annually, uh, and uh, maybe Katrina Murphy, how far out are we approved? Based on the success, though, we fully expect continued funding. So and if we approve this, so then next year we'd have to approve it again? Is that, that that's I'd how I'd have goes? to pull up the resolution on my phone with the way that the future well, it, expenditures. It says, um, Christy, can you speak to this? I tried, Christy. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> my post-it note wasn't good enough. Yes. So in the resolution, there was a request for two, for renewals for the next two fiscal years, and that's because the approval through September of 2024 runs into the 2025 fiscal year. So then next summer, you would come back and ask for the approval for the 25, FY25? No, I believe that this resolution in includes this would take that, that includes the renewals through next year and 2025. Okay. So Thank as you. long as we have funding, and if we continue to be funded beyond this fiscal period, the the funder will change, 
in that this is currently Esser's dollars. And so we would be, we're gonna be working hopefully with Brian over the next year to really work with our um, state legislators to look and see if there will be more permanent funding for this initiative. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, you're welcome. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you, Chair Bessenbaum. Thank you, Christy. Thanks, Greg. Great project. Resolution 2023.05-22, Authorization to Acquire Property Insurance. Illinois State University, as a member of the Illinois Public Higher Education Cooperative, IPHEC, has participated in a hybrid group cooperative purchase of property insurance placed by property insurance broker Alliance Assurance Services, Inc., and covered by the Alliance Property Insurance Program, APIP. APIP provides public entities across the country access to property insurance solutions and price <coughs> stability through APIP's group purchasing power. This trend is fueled by APIP's nearly 10,000 covered entities in 38 states and $540 billion in total insurance values. APIP is among the largest property placements worldwide. IPHEC has secured their own independent tower of coverage within the APIP nationwide program. This independent tower of coverage allows IPHEC members to take advantage of our minimal loss history and not share similar rates and rate increases as other APIP members who have coastal and earthquake insurance. This customized tower of coverage allows IPHEC members access to com comprehensive and very cost competitive property insurance coverage. FY24's property insurance renewal amount is projected to be approximately $1.38 million which is an increase of $180,000 of 15% over prior year. That's at Illinois State. Historical annual increases have typically ranged between eight to 15%. Actual cost will not be known until final renewal codes are received, typically in the late July or early August of 2023. This increase in insurance premium in FY24 is not a reflection of significant property insurance losses reported by Illinois State University or other IPHEC members during fiscal year 23, but is largely the result of current inflationary market conditions, labor shortages, increased material costs, and related supply chain issues. For fiscal year 2024, the university's property insurance program will have $1 billion per occurrence, per occurrence coverage limit with a $100,000 deductible payable for each occurrence. The property insurance exposure is further mitigated by the university's self-insurance fund of approximately $1.2 million. The university seeks board approval to acquire adequate property insurance coverage for fiscal year 2024 from a collection of well-respected and financially sound U.S. and international insurance companies collectively priced as a consortium through Alliant Insurance Services, Inc. at an annual premium not to exceed $1.38 million. Cost will be funded by general revenue and auxiliary facility systems <coughs> operating revenues. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved, Abakumi. Trustee Abakumi made the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Trustee Navarro uh, seconded the resolution. Is there any discussion? Trustee Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is, I see that we said the typical annual increases are from 8% to 15%. Um, and this resolution is only requesting a 15% increase, but it says this is just because of supply chain and all those other things. It's not about the significant property loss that has happened for any of these members. I know we had a property loss 
and this seems to indicate that other IPEC members may have had and lost as well. I may be being too simplistic with this, but when I have a large claim on my insurance, typically the next year that might be reflected in my premiums. Are we concerned that 15% is not enough? because that's where it's been without these large claims and that it might actually be more of an increase this year because of the claims? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for your questions. Um, based on conversations, we traditionally have brought this resolution actually in July once right. we had all the bids. Right. But given the governor documents of going into the fiscal year and wanting to honor the, uh, the respect of the board that we need to have the insurance, we chose the 15% maximum amount now, fortunately, our loss that we have incurred, um, relatively speaking, in an insurance environment, uh, I think our loss was a couple million dollars, likely will not impact us significantly. Uh, when you're in a, in a consortium of, um, uh, of large institutions, and our tower that's listed there is the Illinois, uh, the Illinois institutions that are part of there, uh, we're, we're looking at the overall base of all of their coverage as well as ours. So I really don't anticipate that our loss experience that we had this particular year will have a, a material impact at all. And we're actually hoping that perhaps some of this conservative nature of adding 15% may be a little bit mitigated because of some of the inflationary factors coming that might be coming down. But we wanted to be conservative. If in the end the bids come back and it exceeds, that amount we certainly will have to come back to you uh, with the actual resolution because we will have missed the estimate. But I really don't feel like we'll end up ha being impacted by our loss and I haven't heard of any other material losses within the state of Illinois that would cause a significant change in our premium or theirs. Thank you. That was going to be my follow-up question. Had you heard anything about any no. other losses? So based on the information that you've had, even though we don't have the final, and we won't have that until July or August, you feel like we're pretty comfortable at 15%, even though that's usually our maximum. Yes, my desire is to not to have repetitive uh, <laughs> resolutions and yeah, stand thank here. Thank you, that's where we've stay, gone with that. Stand here any longer than I have to. <laughs> thank so, you. Thank you for your questions. That. Yes. You know, 15%, you know, it's usually 8 to 15%. Mm -hmm. This looks like it's going to be 15%. Have you looked at other options? We continue literally every year. And a matter of fact, if, if I may draw back some history a few years ago, um, we were in a different consortium. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that consortium um, uh, uh, placed us with some losses at some other major universities within the region. I want to say there was a, a major library loss at a school in Kansas. And, um, but because of that, we actually changed, ultimately changed brokers. The state of Illinois, uh, the, all the universities within Illinois worked together and created, again, this independent tower. Um, and so hopefully our, our sister schools along with us have similar risk avoidance plans, uh, but we are at the mercy of others in it. But thankfully we're in a large group to, to mitigate, even if, it's, even if events like a, a, a major loss occurs, that premiums uh, won't get drastically increased. So I'm hoping my 15% that I put in is on the high end, okay. uh, but we'll certainly uh, uh, bring you abreast of that uh, at the next meeting, even if we don't even have to bring back a resolution. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you, Chairperson Bowen. Resolution 2023.05-23, authorization to lease warehouse space at 1201 East Bell Street, Bloomington, Illinois. To facilitate the upcoming construction and renovations uh, for the ISU Engineering Building Complex Development at the John Green Building, all existing contents must be removed from the building as ISU has insufficient available space to accommodate all existing equipment and content currently located in this space. To address this issue, ISU recently conducted a public <coughs> request for information and RFI process to uh, solicit approximately 40,000 to 50,000 square feet of general usage warehouse storage space within the McLean County area for lease for a period not to exceed 10 years and a minimum rental of five years. 
Based on a comparative analysis, the university is recommending real estate property owned by Staley Development LLC to lease approximately 43,000 square feet of general usage warehouse space located at 1201 East Bell Street, Bloomington, Illinois 61701. The lease term shall be for a period not to exceed 10 years, including the original lease period and subsequent renewals. It's estimated to begin July 1, 2023. The original lease period will be for a minimum of 60 months, covering the estimated lease period June 1, 2023 through May, 1, May 31, 2028. The second lease period will extend for a period of 12 months for five individual and consecutive annual renewals if exercised beginning on or around June 1, 2028 through May 31 of 2032. Annual rent for the first five years will equate to approximately $530,000 per year or $2.65 million over five years, including reasonable common area maintenance and utility related charges. If lease renewal is exercised by Illinois State University, annual rent for the second five years will equal approximately $460,000 per year or $2.3 million over five years, including reasonable common area maintenance and utility related charges. The university was successful in negotiating up to $500,000 in required renovations cost paid by the landlord and am amortized over the annual lease payments in the first 60 months of the lease. Any unused funds will be redirected by the landlord to offset annual lease payments due from the university under the same lease period. Total project cost includes the lease the lease cost and some additional costs needed to begin uh, project related activities that need to be started and completed over the next three to six months. Estimated project costs are not to exceed 5.65 million over a total of 10 years and will be funded by general revenue and AFS housing and dining funds. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved. The motion is uh, made by Trustee Jones. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Trustee Navarro, second. Is there any discussion? Madam Chair, I have a question. <clears throat> Trustee Jones. Thank you. I see that by using this storage, so I have a two-part question. One, how full is the storage going to be when we move the things that we're expecting to move there? And two, some of the items that we're moving are from a facility that we already own as a university. So what are we going to be doing with that facility? Uh, that's correct. Thank you very much for, the, for those questions that would be helpful in allowing me to clarify exactly this strategy. We currently own, I issue currently has warehouse space actually out on Warehouse Road. That warehouse space has been used predominantly for both our archives, um, our library archives in the back section, and then the, the front section of the warehouse has been used for predominantly surplus items. We're not permitted to, to even um, broken furniture or, or items can't, we can't dispose of those. We actually have to return a lot of those operation, uh, those items back to the state or through a process. We're just not allowed to dispose of them individually. So our current warehouse that we have today is really used as a surplus. Well, John Green, which is where we're planning to redesign and use it for the engineering labs, is where we've been hosting our facilities operations uh, for equipment and supplies, for all the maintenance types of things. So that has been sitting in John Green for a number of years. Our goal is to move the operations out of John Green to our warehouse road. We'll be making some investment there uh, in order to put, come back with shelving, in order to optimize that as well as optimize personnel um, and make the long-term investments in our own facility, hence the reason for this being a five-year lease initially, um, to 
hopefully over time, have our own warehouse facility, you choosing that and having uh, an ability to have less storage space like that type of this over time. Uh, we did need to extend the lease out a lot further depending on the timing of this, but our ultimate goal is to have all of our warehousing needs, whether it is for operational needs or storage, to all sitting underneath our roof, but in the meantime, in order to move things forward with the academic buildings and to get things, we were fortunate enough to find an operational warehouse. It will be substantially filled. Uh, that's why we needed something of that size, which is very similar to, you know, to John Green. So we're very thankful to the organization that's uh, planning to work with us on this. And uh, we think it's going to be a, a very good investment, especially in the short term. And then over the next several years, we'll be figuring out how to make the investments here or to continue to operate under a, a very cost-effective lease that we have. Thank you. Any other discussion? Do we anticipate having to build our own? Madam Chair, you recognize it. Trustee Abakumi. Abakumi. Um, I'm sorry, can you, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Do you, sorry, you anticipate you. having to um, build our own uh, warehouse facility? Because it seems like there isn't any space in the surrounding area to kind of house us? Um, one of the things that we've been thinking about it, it really depends also on some additional properties around Bloomington Normal that may become available for other, possibly other relocations of the um, um, archives. If we, if we get state appropriations for our library, there's a good opportunity that we'd be able to potentially bring back some of our archives back onto campus. Right now we've got warehouse a current warehouse uh, outfitting that. If we chose to need to um, continue to have warehousing space there, we would prefer to actually build it on our own property and actually build exactly what we do need. And so um, right now we're using this as a temporary situation, but down the road as we work through all of this operations, our goal is to minimize our investment uh, in in type of surplus warehousing where we can because unfortunately it's just not as value added storing that type of material. We do have space out at the warehouse, additional land, um, uh, but we'd have to do a cost benefit analysis to see whether it's it is more cost effective to build rather than lease. We did get an offer in one of the proposals to build a lease, to build a building of this size. Um, and to lease to us, and but it was five times the rate. So uh, at that that and we would end up having to spend that kind of money. So leasing this under somebody else's operations is actually more cost effective at this time. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed. <coughs> The resolution is approved. Thank you, Chairperson Bone. Resolution 2023.05-24, authorization for approval of the Gamo Hall Plaza Deck Repairs, Phase 2. The Gamos Hall Open Plaza Deck is in various stages of accelerating roof-slash-plaza deck failure, with increasing water infiltration requiring urgent repair, replacement, and modif modifications on an ongoing basis to maintain building functionality. After an initial public bid failure in 2022, ISU completed an updated project original scope estimate and subsequently revised the required project scope into two separate phases and rebid the work in 2023. A single responsible contractor's bid was received in March of 2023. The responsible bidders phase one bid is within the Board of Trustees authority approved on October 15 of 2021. However, the responsible bidders phase two bid requires additional authority to complete the project in the summer of 2024. The university is seeking authorization from the board for an additional capital project to complete the remaining phase two construction work. If approved to proceed, the university plans to award a contract to Gulf Construction to fully restore the Gamos Plaza deck functionality and weather tightness 
to, imp uh, to impacted building spaces during the summer of 2024 at a cost to not exceed $3.5 million. The source of funding for this project is general revenue funds and academic enhancement fee. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved, Abakumi. Uh, Trustee Abakumi made the motion. Is there a second? Second, Jenkins. Trustee Jenkins, second. Is there any discussion? Trustee Jones. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's right, then, uh, Vice President <laughs> Stevens. So just, just for some clarification, so in um, our last resolution um, in 2021, we approved $3.1 million, correct, for the project? That's correct. And I understand there were some cost overruns. There were some things that were unexpected. So is this n n for phase two, which we thought was in, some of that we thought was in phase one. We had 3.1 million, now we're doubling that and, and it's virtually the same project, but some unforeseen things that we had. So now the project is double. Yes, this has been or more quite a that. challenging, yes, quite a challenging um, uh, project. We, uh, to, get to, to go back to the time whenever we were presenting the resolution in October 21, we were looking at um, estimates and costs that we used exactly on the Milner Plaza, uh, the Milner Plaza uh, water degradation that went down into the first floor of Milner um, was experiencing the same thing around DeGarmo. And so our, our cost estimations and using in that ended up, um, um, as you can imagine, turned in by the time we received the bid. By the time we received the bid, in this particular case, we only received one bid. We actually had a failed bid in the December of, 02, uh, 02, uh, of 22. And so unfortunately, whenever we rebid the process out there and got an organization to bid, and thankfully we did find someone to bid, um, the cost came back at significantly higher. Um, we believe, unfortunately, when you've got water penetration continuing to come through, anytime you're, you're looking at that, it, it doesn't stop. The degradation doesn't stop. And I, I also believe that the cost of this, unfortunately, hit at a time frame where uh, a lot of the a lot of the contractors that are in this space, uh, both within Bloomington Normal or 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 because we did not receive any local bids for this, we ended up receiving a bid from someone in Chicago, and we're thankful that they did. So the cost just simply came in at substantially higher than what we could e even could have ever imagined. So we split the uh, re we split the project essentially into two phases. We're starting the first phase with uh, this summer. We cannot do that project during the academic year because it's, it's over faculty, offices, and labs. And then our, our hope is that you'll approve this project and by next summer we'll complete it and it should be a at least 30 to 40 year type of improvement just like what we did at Milner Plaza about three or four years ago. I'm sorry, I'm finding it hard to say thank you to Double. Uh, you mean to. Uh, you you're, trust you're, you me. answered my question. Trust me. I, I, <laughs> this is a challenging one to bring, and it's just, it's just unfortunate given all the, surround, all the events that have occurred. Yes, ma'am. I have a question also, and thank you, Trustee Jones. Um, do we have any assurance that, you know, we're going to do half of it 2023 and half of it 2024 next summer? Um, can we put like a cap on how much it would increase or can uh, well, we we, increase that part again? Well, this part is that what you have in front of you actually are, is the actual contract bids mm -hmm. versus okay. estimates. So it's so guaranteed. That is correct. That okay. is correct. Thank you. And they're going to start before it gets more expensive. No, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the, unfortunately we thought about that issue. What if we delay and but it just continues to degrade and we'd eventually run into the, the situation where we'd have to close that area and try to relocate important faculty and student spaces and that's unfortunately we could not or chose not to, to do that. Is there any other discussion? Uh, Trustee Merminga. Thank you. Um, is there any contingency included in the 3.1 million? Oh, there's contingency in, in, in each of our projects, yes. But, um, How much is that, roughly, please? 
Um, what percentage? We typically do somewhere around between 5 to 10 percent contingency, uh, by and large, on any of our bids. Uh, or excuse me, any of our, our uh, resolutions that we do, and if obviously we don't spend the contingency, then or don't need the contingency, then we um, uh, we don't spend those funds. And based on historical data, is the five to ten percent contingency adequate to complete the scope on time and within the budget? Uh, yes, as long as the uh, the scope awareness, especially in a bid process, where you uh, a bid process requires architectural and engineering documents down to a very detailed level. That is, uh, we have to spend money in order to reach those types of documents. So we feel really comfortable in those particular settings. Unfortunately, when we are, we don't have that level of specificity for other, for other projects that we haven't bidded, we are dealing with general estimates and we try to do our best, but we always have felt pretty good with anywhere between a five to 10% contingency. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson Bone. I will now uh, move on to the 12th resolution. For those keeping track, there are 20. <laughs> Eight more to go. Resolution 2023.05-25. Authorization for two-way radio service contract. Two-way radios have been a decades-long reliable method for university personnel to remain in real contact with one another. While cellular phones and two-way radio applications on cellular phones offer potential companions to or future replacements of traditional two-way radios, physical radios remain the most effective option for most daily and special event operations. The university is nearing the end of a 10-year hardware and service contract with Clear Talk Communications, Inc. for such services. The provided services during the past 10 years have met operational expectations. The two-way radio infrastructure is located at top Watterson Towers, which yields ID coverage for the campus footprint extending throughout Bloomington Normal and up to the Lexington Farm. Separately from the original 2014 two, ra two radio hardware and service contract, the university licensed space on the Watterson Towers roof for the antenna and transmission infrastructure for two-way radios used on campus by other public safety agencies and other clear talk communications customers. The license agreement is also nearing its expiration term and the license to retain the water scene roof space will be considered as a concession related to this uh, proposed sole source procurement. Most of the current two-way radios were purchased in 2014 and had support discontinued by Motorola several years ago. The price to assess and repair an existing radio has neared the cost to purchase a new radio. New model radios are being introduced in 2023, which meet university requirements <coughs> and should have an operational life of between five and 10 years. Ultimately, this proposal recommends the following. One, continuing service with the same two-way radio provider with a new multi-year contract in place and two, replacing nearly all two-way radios with current models. The bulk of the cost for this service come at the beginning of the contract with the purchase of radios and accessories. Subsequent annual costs include the purchase of radios, accessories, and monthly usage fees based on the number of active radios. The university is seeking board authorization to enter into a five-year contract from July 1, 2023 through June 30th of 2028 with renewal options for five additional years with current provider Clear Talk Communications Inc. at a total cost not to exceed $1,388,400. The source of funds for this project includes general revenue and bond revenue funds. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? 
So moved, Ebukumi. Uh, Trustee Ebukumi made the motion. Second. Second by Trustee Merminga. Is there any discussion? Madam Chair. Uh, Trustee Ebukumi. Um, I've got a thank you. I've got a question about the the antenna on top of Washington Towers. Uh, President Darhuli said that public services um, and also also use that radio uh, tower. Do they pay into the the license that that we will purchase, or is that something that we take on as you know just being a part of the community? Well, oh, thank you for that question. Um, are we sure we don't want Dan to come up? <laughs> 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 just just say. I'm just, just saying, given the opportunity. Um, I'm actually going to ask for, is Eric Hodges still in? There he is, OK. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask for an applause while you come up, <laughs> although I'm tempted. OK, it's a great question. He'll talk a little bit about the agreement with the uh, antenna up there. Good morning. Uh, yeah, that system's called um, Starcom. That's the statewide public safety radio system. ClearTalk manages both their business infrastructure and that Starcom system on behalf of Motorola. Motorola itself for that public safety system does not pay ISU for that privilege. Um, so they have the space on top of Waterson Towers in an exchange ISU public safety, the police department, emergency management, and health and safety get to use up to 100 radios at no charge that is going to be renegotiated as well. Yeah. Do we know the value of that antenna and the property it sits on? Facilities has done some market <coughs> research on that, but we don't have another system like that right around yeah. campus. So I don't know the exact dollar value of that, but that's, we're going to try to make that as equitable as possible in that, in that negotiation. Thank you. Yep. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you. Resolution 2023.05-26, Authorization to Renew Athletics Ticketing System Agreement. The Illinois State University Athletics Department has contracted with Pekeolan, Inc. since 1991 for its event ticketing system. Pekeolan continues to be recognized as the industry leader in intercollegiate athletics ticketing. Pekeolan continues to support the department with annual trainings and system upgrades, including the addition of Fine Arts eVenue, which will allow the Wonsor Kim College of Fine Arts a unique online platform for selling their venue tickets. Athletics and Fine Arts have partnered on this contract for the mutual benefit of the student and community base to provide end users with ticketing platform continuity for applicable events. The current contract with Pekeolan is in effect through June 30th of 2023. Pekeolan was selected to continue to provide intercollegiate collegiate athletics ticketing and donor <coughs> system support along with the addition of a fine arts ticketing platform for the university for five years with the potential for five additional years. The athletics department seeks board authorization to contract with Bikeolan until June 30th of 2033 at a cost not to exceed $300,000 per year for a total potential spend of $3 million over the life of the potential 10-year contract and funded by athletics department's urgency account and general operating resources. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? I so move. Trustee Navarro made the motion. Is there a second? Second. second. Trustee Jones, second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you, Chairperson Bone. Resolution 2023.05-27, authorization for sports supply renewal with current vendor BSN. Since 2006, Illinois State Athletics teams have purchased footwear equipment uh, apparel and uniforms from a primary vendor and manufacturer. A vendor contract provides a reduction in purchasing time, paperwork, 
and most importantly reduced costs by placing orders within specified deadlines to take advantage of wholesale pricing and date sensitive discounts. The look and feel of the athletic teams is consistent through the use of a primary supplier which continues to be Nike. In anticipation of the upcoming renewal period with BSN, the athletics department has given consideration to the goods and services provided through BSN over the first four years of the contract. It was determined that the quality of goods and services provided through the BSN contract is consistent with department needs. As a result, to begin July 1, 2023, the athletics department desires to move forward with the available two-year renewal of the current contract. This resolution seeks authorization to renew the current BSN approved contract for two years at a cost not to exceed $1.5 million during the contract period. Following the term to begin July 1, 2023, there will be three years remaining on the contract. The source of funding is at Athletics Department's agency account and general operating resources. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved. Trustee Jones made the motion. Is there a second? Second, Abakumi. Trustee Abakumi, second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> the resolution is approved. Thank you. I now move to some NEMI resolutions. Resolution 2023.05-28, authorization to name Bob Dellinger crew room. I note for the record that Bob is here yeah. in this room. Bob, you want to? The Division of Student Affairs in consultation and support from University Advancement respectfully requests the naming of the crew room, that's room 36, in the Braden Auditorium as the Bob Dellinger Crew Room. This naming reflects and rec recognizes the generous financial commitment by Bob Dellinger to Braden Auditorium. Bob Dellinger, a 1981 BS, 01 MS is a 30 year employee of ISU and has devoted her entire adult life to Illinois State University. Beginning her work at Illinois State in 1991 in the College of Fine Arts, Bob went on to hold various positions in the Division of Student Affairs, including the following departments University Housing Services, Campus Dining Services, the Dean of Students' Office the Bone Student Center slash Braden Auditorium and Event Management, Dining and Hospitality until her retirement in 2022. Bob has worked with groups such as Pride, University Program Board, and the Info Center staff at the Bone Student Center Braden Auditorium. She is also credited with creating the LGBTQA Alumni Network which has served several hundreds of ISU alumni. With a reputation of mentoring and impacting the lives of countless students, Bob has received the Illinois State University Distinguished Service Award, the Neil R. Gamske Quality of Student Life Award, and numerous Division of Student Affairs Star Awards. She has served as the chair of the Triangle Association and the LGBTQ faculty staff organization. Bob has also served on the boards of the LGBT Queer Studies Institute, the Illinois Sodius and Salios, Salos Children's School, Historical Preservation Society, and Illinois State University Friends of the Arts. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? I so move. Trustee Navarro made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Trustee Jones, second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved.
I would just like to add that I think we all miss you, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Barb, for your years of service. Resolution 2023.05-29, authorization to name Palm and Dan Kelly family, student, and staff workroom. The Mennonite College of Nursing respectfully requests naming the simulation center student and staff workroom in the newly created nursing simulation center as the Palm and Dan Kelly family, student, and staff workroom. This naming reflects and recognizes the generous financial commitment by Dan and Pam Kelly for the new nursing building. Graduating in 1970 from Illinois State University with a degree in agriculture, Dan Kelly has been a longtime and well-respected leader in agribusiness. He is the former chairman of the board and president of Gromark Inc., a local agriculture supply and Grain Cooperative. Over the years, Dan has received numerous awards and accolades for his work, including receiving the Director of the Year Award from the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. Dan, with his two brothers and son, currently operates a grain farm in Normal. Dan has been a proud Redbird leader as well, serving on Illinois State University's Alumni Association Board including as the president. He's been an active member on ISU's foundation's board of directors since 2015, and he and Pam led our very successful Redbirds Rising campaign as committed campaign co-chairs. As Dan noted at the launch of the campaign, Redbirds Rising presents an exciting opportunity for those who love Illinois State to invest in its future. Through his generous philanthropic gift to the university and commitment of time, Dan has certainly made his own substantial investment in ISU's future. Dan and his wife Pam have a personal desire to make sure there are well-educated nurses and so have been donors to Illinois State University's Mennonite College of Nursing for many years. They know how important a nurse can be after their daughter became gravely ill and was cared for by a well-trained, compassionate nurse, nurses. Dan eloquently shared his family story at MCN Centennial Celebration in 2019. The Kellys have pledged funds to support a space for the nursing students and staff who will be working in the new Mennonite College of Nursing Simulation Center. This space will be a dedicated area for the student lobbies and staff to plan simulation scenarios, review upcoming assignments, and collaborate. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? I so move. Uh, Trustee Navarro made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Trustee Abakumi is second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Dan is not in the room, I, but I suggest we give him a big round of applause. For his <laughs> resolution number 2023.05-30, authorization to name Beth and J. Matthews Innovation and Technology Room. The Mennonite College of Nursing respectfully requests naming one of the two white box innovation and technology rooms in the newly constructed Mennonite College of Nursing Simulation Center as the Beth and J. Matthews Innovation and Technology Room. This naming reflects and recognizes the generous financial commitment by Beth and J. Matthews for the new nursing building. Beth, a 1977 graduate, and husband, Jay Matthews, have been generous and engaged donors to the Mennonite College of Nursing for several years. Beth is a well-respected nurse, nurse practitioner and has worked closely with the faculty at Mennonite College on educating nurses in primary care settings. An official Redbird bell ringer in 2019, Beth believes in the values of Mennonite College and champions its role in addressing the nursing shortage. 
The Martyrs have not only financially supported the Mennonite College of Nursing's in Innovative uh, Leadership Academy for the past five years, but also attend many of its events, such as the annual etiquette dinner where they dine and converse with nursing students. The couple who live in Champaign often come to campus to take part in college and university programs, including the Lincoln Dinner and official alumni activities. As members of the 1857 Society, the Matthews were recently featured in Illinois State University's State Magazine as influential Redbird philanthropist. Bert has been a zealous ambassador for the Mennonite College of Nursing, connecting development staff to others who may be interested in supporting the new nursing simulation lab. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved. Trustee Abakumi made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Trustee Jones, second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. I don't believe the martyrs are in the room, but let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> resolution 2023.05-31, authorization to name William and Betty Duff and Robert and Mary Newbrander Administrative Faculty Office. The Mennonite College of Nursing respectfully requests the naming of the Administrative Faculty Office in the newly constructed Nursing Simulation Center as the William and Betty Duff and Robert and Mary Newbrander Administrative Faculty Office. This <coughs> naming reflects and recognizes the generous financial commitment by Judy and David Newbrander. Dr. Judy Newbrander has been the visionary, innovative dean of the Mennonite College of Nursing at Illinois State University since 2016. Dr. Newbrander is a tenured nursing professor who has over 20 years of academic experience. Under Dr. Newbrander's leadership, ISU's nursing college has had many successes, including one, creating a student's leadership academy for senior students to help them thrive in the workforce. Two, hosting a long, year-long community-wide celebration of their 100th anniversary as a nursing school. Three, reinvigorating our cultural uh, program by creating a public health experiential program in Panama for ISU students. Four, starting the first clinical trials at Illinois State University. Five, launching a 10-year partnership <coughs> with a major hospital system that will create a new nursing campus location in Springfield. Six, securing major federal grants to increase diversity in nursing, support nursing in rural areas, and expose nurses to primary care sites, especially within clinics and offices serving patients with little access to health care. And seven, maintaining nursing licensure pass rates that far exceed state and national averages. Dr. Newbrander is a tireless dean and is well respected by her peers uh, at the leadership level for her tenacity and hard work. In February of this year, Dr. Newbrander was formally accepted into the American Council on Education's Fellows Program. She also serves on numerous community boards, volunteers at a local free clinic, and enjoys spending time with husband David, two sons, daughter-in-law, and new granddaughter. For several years, Dr. Newbrander has passionately pursued the idea of building a new nursing simulation center to support the college's ambitious plans for growth, as she is keenly aware of the need for more nurses. She and her husband, David, have felt so strongly about this project that they would like to personally support it and honor and memorialize their parents at the same time. Judy and David Newbrander have therefore pledged support of funds to support an administrative faculty office for a faculty member who will be working in the Mennonite College of Nursing Simulation Center. I ask for your approval for this resolution. 
May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved. Trustee Jones made the motion. Is there a second? A second. Uh, Trustee Merminga, second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> the resolution is approved. Thank you, Chairperson Bond. Uh, Judy was here previously, but I think she had to go to another event. Let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> resolution 2023.05-32, authorization to name Smith Family Conference Room. The Mennonite College of Nursing respectfully requests naming the small conference room in the newly constructed nursing simulation center as the Smith Family Conference Room. This naming reflects and recognizes the generous support by Steve Smith for the new facility. Steve Smith has been a proud Redbird, an engaged alum, generous donor, and committed volunteer to Illinois State University for many years. He received his Bachelor of Science in Public Relations in 1989, a Master of Science in Communications in 1993. Steve is currently the CEO of Association Management Center in Chicago, which supports and advises healthcare associations across the country. Reflecting a long-term interest in healthcare and older adults, Steve has had executive positions at the Alzheimer's Association and the American Ac Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. An active member on the Illinois State University Alumni Association Board of Directors, Steve is highly respected for his knowledge of best practices in governance and board development. In 2016, Steve was inducted into ISU's Division of Student Affairs, Steve and Sandy Adams Legacy Hall of Fame. In 2022, the Mennonite College of Nursing asked Steve to help advise and facilitate its newly created Dean's Cabinet. Steve created a Smith Family Ger Geriatric Nursing Scholarship in the Mennonite College of Nursing in 2022 to support a nursing student pursuing a career in oncology, geriatrics, or palliative care. The Smiths have also made generous gifts to Illinois State for the past 15 years, supporting campus experience funds Alumni Association Scholarships, Greek Life, and leadership, student leadership programs. Steve was the very first donor to express a desire to name a space in the new Mennonite College of Nursing Simulation Center. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? I so move. Second. Uh, Trustee Navarro made the motion. Trustee Jones, second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you, Chairperson Bond. I don't believe the Smiths are in the room, but let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and another naming resolution for whom I see the benefactors in the room. Resolution 2023.05-33, Authorization to name Sillinger slash Trite Conference Room. And I note for the record, or uh, I thought I did, yes, I see George and Roberta Trite in the room. The College of Arts and Sciences respectfully request naming Stevenson Hall Room 140 as the Sillinger slash Trite Conference Room. This generous commitment from distinguished professor of English, Dr. Roberto Sillinger Trite, and emeritus professor of mathematics, Dr. George Sillinger, will recognize their legacies, combining to total more than 50 years at Illinois State University uh, and in the College of Arts and Sciences. The careers of Dr. Trite and Dr. Sillinger have been marked by a dual commitment to advancing their respective fields and serving the college and university. Since joining ISU's Department of English in 1991, Dr. Trites has become a leading expert in the field of children's literature, publishing six scholarly books and earning the prestigious International Brothers Grimm Award. 
recognizing prominent contributions in children's literature. During her career at ISU, Dr. Trite served as Associate Dean and Acting Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Interim Chair of the Department of Management and Quantitative Methods, and Interim Associate Vice President for Academic Administration, where I worked with her. Dr. Sillinger first came to Illinois State University as a visiting assistant professor in 1999 and, and went on to serve as department chair from 2002 until his retirement in 2022. During his time as chair, Dr. Sillinger helped implement important programmatic initiatives in the Department of Mathematics, including implementing a joint program in statistic, statistics with Tianhu College, Shanghai Normal University, and supported the development of an online actuarial master's program. This naming would provide recognition of the contributions Dr. Trite and Dr. Sillinger have made to Illinois State University and would provide the first space in Stevenson Hall named in honor of faculty. Aligning with the core values of learning and scholarship laid out in Educate, Connect, Elevate, this naming would recognize Dr. Trite's and Dr. Sillinger's commitment and embodiment of this core value throughout their years of distinguished service to the college and the university. Sometimes referred to anecdotally as the college's conference room, this naming would serve as a physical embodiment of the interdisciplinary nature of the College of Arts and Sciences and would highlight two individuals who have made a lasting impact and outstanding contributions to two of the three divisions within the College of Arts and Sciences. I ask for your approval for this resolution. May I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved. Uh, Trustee Abakumi made the motion. Is there a second? I second. Trustee Merminga, second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, board and big congratulations to the cylinder and staff. Thank you, and believe it or not, this concludes the resolutions <laughs> for today. I would now entertain a motion to move into closed session for the purpose of discussing the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees pursuant to 5 ILCS 120-2C1 to discuss to discuss collective negotiation, negotiating bargaining matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives pursuant to C ILCS 120-2 C2 to discuss the purchase or lease of real property for use of the public body pursuant to 5 ILCS 120-2 C5 and to discuss litigation that has been filed and is pending before court or administrative tribunal sub pursuant to 5 ILCS 120-2 C11. May I have a motion to second, a motion and a second to approve the motion to move into closed session. So moved. Second. Trustee Jones made the motion. Trustee Abakumi second. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Trustee Navarro, will you please call for roll call vote? Yes. Trustee Bone. I'm sorry. Trustee uh, Bone. Yes. Trustee Abakumi. Yes. Trustee Jenkins. Yes. Trustee Jones. Yes. Trustee Mamringa. Yes. Trustee Navarro. Yes. Motion passes. The motion is approved. We will now move into closed session. Following the closed session, the board will move back into public session solely for the purpose of adjournment. Thank you. <laughs> you did a great job. That is very long. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's always a marathon. That's what I say. It's always a marathon. Try to run slowly. And just pop it. It's impossible. 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 It's impossible.